Uh, my talk will be about uh, the mirror neurons. And what I want to show you that now we change from the idea that there is a specific set of neurons that have some property I explained in a moment, that the whole brain has this mechanism in the sense that the whole brain, or part of it, large part of it, work as a mirror system. But let me start from the very beginning. About 20 years ago, we discovered in the premotor cortex of macaque monkey a set of neurons which fired both when the monkey performed a certain action and when the monkey observed the same action made by the experimenter. In other words, there was a transformation from sensory information that the monkey received to motor information inside her brain. So you see, you transform something it's, which is in outside in the world in something which is in your brain. Before speaking in more detail about the mirror neuron, I must say you that we discovered them when we studied the motor cortex. And that's very important because still the mirror neurons are connected very closely to the motor system. So what we did, uh, we recorded single neurons using exactly those electrodes which has been mentioned by Edward before, the Hubel tungsten <laughs> electrode. As a matter of fact, I was very proud because mine was very good. So I was doing by myself the tungsten electrode, and we recorded single neurons from motor cortex. What was new in our experiment that we used an ethological approach. Usually in the motor system, the people record the dynamic, the kinematics of movement. We recorded the behavior of the monkey during interaction with the experimenter. And the area which we studied most is the ventral premotor cortex, and more specifically, area F5, which is here. Well, there was some surprises. The first surprise was that many neurons in this area did not code movements, but what we call it motor acts. If you stimulate, for example, the motor cortex, you see the switches or movement displacement of joints. But what we found that this neuron fire one, the movement are organized in such a way to reach a goal. So we introduced the concept of goal in the motor cortex. And that was very important then to interpret other data. For example, in this neuron that you see here, the monkey is grasping with the mouth, it's grasping with the right hand, with the left hand. It's the same neuron. So the movements are completely different, but the goal is the same. At this point, somebody objected that in this case, it's a kind of synergy. Maybe mouth and arm are used in the same way. So we have been challenged to do this experiment. In this case, you have a normal pliers in A, and in B, a pliers, which is very strange, because in order to grasp, you have to open the hand. Uh, this has been a suggestion from a French postdoc. And if you remember, in France, the escargot, the snails, are eating using this strange instrument in which you have to open the head. It's very complicated, at least for me. But it was also complicated for the monkey. But anyway, the monkey learned it. So we have an experiment in which the monkey grasped the object using the normal pliers and using these reverse pliers. Now I will show you a, a monkey. And what you have to do is to correlate the action potential that already you saw in the previous lecture. Uh, uh, they are sent to loudspeakers, so it will be tac, 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 and correlate what the monkey is doing and the discharge of neurons. Here is a grasping neuron. Here is using the strange uh, flight, and you have the discharge Look here, the monkey is moving, nothing happens, but when the monkey grasps it, there is a discharge. So we put a potentiometer to measure the things, and you can see the potentiometer when it's going down the curve here, it means that the hand was closing, 
and here the, the, close was, the, the hand was opening. So in spite of opposite movement, you have the discharge which correlates with the goal rather than with the action. Well, the other surprise was that many neurons in the motor cortex was responsive to visual stimuli. At the beginning, still with Gentilucci many years ago, we found that there were neurons. Imagine you have a neuron which fire when the monkey grasps it this way. If you show to the monkey a small object like a seed, there is a discharge. The monkey was completely still. So there was a transformation of this object into action. And now, more recently, in my lab, they found exactly the parameters which are necessary for getting this result. But anyway, the point is there were neurons which fired at one. The object was congruent with the action. The surprise was that, in addition, there were neurons which fired not when the object was presented, but when the monkey saw an action. Here you see one old picture, in B is the monkey grasping, that this uh, small bar are action potential, you see the discharge, and in A is the experimental doing the same thing, and you have the discharge. The same is true for mouth, here is another experiment, and the monkey grasped with the mouth, there was a good discharge, when the monkey sucked from a syringe, was nothing, although visually it's very similar. And the same is true for experimenter, grasping food with the mouth, good discharge, experimenter sucking from a syringe. You know. And food presentation per se was not sufficient, so it was not simply interesting or something salient for the monkey. Now I show you, uh, I show you a film which is rather old, but it's still the best representation I have. Remember, you have to correlate the tac, 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 the action potential, with the behavior of the monkey. Again, a grasping neuron. And un altro così. Come prima, tirina. Ancora. Same neuron, but now it's the person grasping. Fine, You see, it's highly repetitive. That's the reason you know why. So it's grasping. It doesn't matter if grasping is made by hand or by mouth. And you see how it's, uh, you can repeat any time you want. It's not something which is rare that you must do a histogram. When you have a mirror neurons, you can test it until it's alive. Well, what is strange here, that we have a visual action and then there is a discharge in the motor cortex. Here, the best explanation has been done by Marc Janero, which Paul mentioned it before. He was really the first who understood the importance of motor system for cognition before our discoveries. And he wrote, a mere visual perception without involvement of the motor system would only provide a description of the visible aspect of the movements, but it would not give precise information about the intrinsic components of the observed action, which are critical for understanding what is actually about, what is its goal, and how to reproduce it. Uh, how to reproduce it means imitation, but I am not going to talk about that. But the other, I think, is very important. So you understand the action of the other if you have it in your motor repertoire. Now I will show later some example. However, that's very nice, but one can say, well, what is the evidence that mirror neurons somehow are related to actual understanding? And one thing that people object to say, what about other modalities? Why you don't try to use 
auditory modalities. If these neurons are related to understanding the action, it should be the same. Imagine that you're in your hotel and you listen to somebody walking. You understand very well the action. You don't need to see. And the blind people are very good in that, for example. Well, so we did an experiment. That I will show you our protocol, let's say. So the small bar are actions, potentials, and the histogram. You see that one experimenter tears a sheet of papers in two pieces and the monkey sees it. There is a discharge. Now the experiment consisted in placing a barrier so the monkey cannot see the action but ca can hear the specific noise that when you break a sheet of paper, you can hear. And here is the answer. The response is still there. So it doesn't matter if the monkey sees or hear the action, there is still a discharge. And here is control with white noise. Personally, I like very much single neuron and hear them. But if you want to publish in an important journal, you must do some statistic and complicated thing. And that, that paper has appeared in science, so we have to do the population analysis and many tricks that you probably know already. But the important thing is S. S means only sound. We have 39 neurons, and blue is the sound which is specific for the action, and in red are the responses if you presented some other type of noise, uh, of other action or white noise. Okay. The second evidence in favor of understanding is the following. Now, the monkey will not see at all the object, but can guess that the object is there. So imagine that you are sitting like monkey and sees this video. This is a typical mirror neurons. The girl is grasping an orange and you have the discharge. Oops. Here, there is no object. The action is the same, but there is no object. Now, we will close this uh, the vision of the orange. You see, there is a discharge. The monkey can guess what will be. All of you can understand. If there is an orange and somebody is moving their arm toward the, do it, it's because you want to grasp it. And if there is no object, there is no discharge. Well, in other words, you, if you have sufficient element to understand an action, the mirror neurons fire. Uh, the point is that sometimes people criticize that, say, well, mirror neurons are a relatively small amount of neurons. How they can do all this stuff? Actually, the same effect is present in many other parts of the mirror of the motor system. And the best example has been achieved by Roger Lemon and his group, Kraskov, in London. As you know, Roger is probably the the best scientist in the field of uh, corticospinal tract. And he recorded single neuron from corticospinal tract and found that many of them have mirror properties. That's his data. The red light is neurons which fire when the monkey sees the object. Facilitation, as he called it. And he has found something interesting. There is also a set of neurons which, are, which fire when the monkey grasps, but are inhibited when the monkey observes. So what we discovered, it's not only a group of neurons, but a system which discharge what you see around. So you have, in a sense, the motor schema. When the motor schema that's inside yourself is excited because you see not another people doing it, you understand the action. You have a kind of phenomenological capacity to understand the action. You don't need to think about there is a head which is close to the object and now it's closing, blah, blah, blah. So you understand it directly. Of course, another problem is how these neurons are generated. I don't know how they are generated, but I know the circuit. And that's we did together with uh, uh, Georg Mang, and Nelson experiment has been done in Leuven because they were very clever. 
You know that in order to do fMRI experiment, the person should be still. Cannot move, otherwise you have artifact. And the people said, with the monkey, it will be impossible. Instead, if you train the monkey to sit in a sphinx position and to observe a dot, when the dot change the color, the monkey is reinforced. Well, at this point, the monkey can sit can sit for 40, 45 minutes, ready to receive reward. So they trade the monkey first in the box, and when the monkey is ready, they place it in the standard uh, scanner. So it was a cheap experiment. You don't need a special scanner and so on. So we did this experiment, and the guy, Nelson, was the guy who did most experiment. And then the other people also helped with anatomy. but. The first experiment we did was just pure fMRI. Look at three Tesla, which is here. And so when you observe an action, you have an activation in STS. That's RA, it's called a superior temporal sulcus. There are many others there, as a matter of fact. It has been studied by David Parrott in St. Andrews, and he described it many interesting properties in this area. So this area is the first visual area which became very complicated. Then it's parietal lobe, and now we have data that in, in the inferior parietal lobe there are many mirror neurons, and there is a transformation from action to, to action observation to action, real action. And finally, you see here is the frontal lobe, it's our area. I mentioned it before all these people because after this study, we did one in which we put together fMRI and anatomy, and Lupino was very important in this study. And so we know now that there are two streams coming from temporal lobe. One is coming from upper part of STS, the other from the lower part of STS. And uh, probably this part, which is related also to semantic of the object is useful because when you grasp something, you must know something about the object. It's not that you are completely blind. However, that's the point that should be studied more. The important thing that we have two pathways, one going to area AIP, which traditionally was considered only for object, but there are a lot of mirror neurons, the area PFG, and then it goes to this ensemble, I don't know, to I don't want to go to detail, but RA5 has been now distinguished in different sections. Well, that's monkey, but we decided to move also to humans. And practically, two, a couple of years after discovering mirror neurons, we went to Milano, where was a pet center, and we did the first experiment with the pet center. And I must say it was one of the most I was very emotionally involved in doing this experiment with Pat because it was really dramatic. It was the doctor running with, uh, with radioactive substance and we were looking at what was going on in the brain and after a while you see that motor areas was active. Anyway, it was not like now that fMRI you put just a patient and you do what you want. At that time it was really with Pat rather emotional experiment. However, I will not show you those data, but something done recently, well, five years ago about, uh, by Carl Ziles and his group in, uh, in Ubik. Uh, as you know, Carl is an excellent anatomist, and he made this meta-analysis showing in humans that you have an activation in the region which correspond to STS, which this one, is posterior part of middle temporal gyrus, then you have activation in the parietal lobe, and you have activation in the motor cortex and premotor areas, including in the human often is also the loss of premotor cortex. Uh, it's interesting that from uh, evolutionary point of view, it's very similar to the monkey area. They are maybe more, It's better now.
Okay, you can see here this meta-analysis making you made in Ulich, in which you see that it is very similar to the area which are activated in, in the monkey. And here is an experiment done many years ago in collaboration with Ulich, in which you see that there is also a somatotopy. So if you see a mouth action, you have an activation more ventral, for hand it's more dorsal, and for food it's going even upper in the superior parietal lobe. Okay, now I mentioned it before that in monkey, what counts is the goal. So we did an experiment using a, a robot arm, which has given us by Dario in Pisa. And he, here you see the activation when the head is grasping. Here is the activation, this one. One is the object is grasped by robotic arm. Remember that kinematics is different and of course the shape is different. So there are many variables, yet the activation seems to be almost similar. If you do the subtraction, you find that in the parietal lobe, and precisely here, there is an activation which is specific for tools. This area, it's important for neurologists because uh, lesion of this part or of the connection from this part to the motor cortex produce what is called ideomotor apraxia. So you are unable to use tools. There are many other symptoms, but important that you are unable to use tools. So we have there a, a probably a model how to use tool, an engram, a motor engram how to use tool. So we presented to the monkey, to the human, to the students, other type of instrument and always on the left side of the brain in the parietal lobe we have this activation. That's important because it indicates that even for something, I will come back to that later, that even for something which is obviously evolutionarily very late, we have already a model which allows us, one has been mentioned before, Tolman and his idea of model, I think I'm very close to this idea, that we have model of things that then we are using for understanding what we are doing. However, one should be very careful. I have some friends which are too good and said everything can be understood by mirror neurons, which is not true. So we did an experiment that you can see here. We presented to students lying in the scanner, action done by a person, by the monkey and by the dog. The person was biting, the dog was not biting, and the monkey as well. Everybody was doing the same action that all three species are able to do. Second part of the experiment, we show it. This guy reading a newspaper, and you see only the lips moving, so no sound. The monkey was doing lip smacking. That's an affiliative gesture that the monkey perform what they don't know if you are good or you are an enemy, it's kind of a stick quiet, I, I am good. The monkey make, it's called it lips making, ethologist knows very well this. And the dog was barking, again, no sound. Now, the result. Here is biting. If you look at the left hemisphere, which is the most important for this action, Virtually, there is no difference. If I do a subtraction, it's zero. So when I look to a dog biting, my mirror system is active exactly as if I am doing the same action. So that may be on the basis why the people tend to anthropologize the, the animals. On. But for some action, really, we are the same. Of course, it will be a spider there. Even with rat and <laughs> There is much less sympathy towards rodents than <laughs> towards <laughs> the monkey. However, the interesting result was here. If you look at the man lip reading, there is activation of Broca's area, there is activation here of the temporal lobe. I, I, I mean, there is activation of typical oral communication uh, areas. For monkey, there is very little here, and for dog, was nothing was the visual area. So barking, we don't understand using mirror system. We understand using inferential thinking. 
So like an apple which is falling down, and we understand it's going on because they are gravity and so on. When the dog, is, but think, can you bark? Of course not. You can imitate bark, you can make some sound. There is an interesting, I am a friend of a French philosopher and he wrote me, my son, I asked my son, would you like to be a dog? And he said, oh no, why? Because I am able to move my tail. <laughs> Which is really true, it's really a deep consideration. We, we cannot do something which other animals do. In this case, we have to use our, uh, we should become logical and do inferential thinking. So we know the dog is barking for some reason and so on. But that's very important. So we have two ways to understand the things. One is from inside using our model and put what we see on our model. The other is just reasoning. So there is no controversy. As a matter of fact, now I have spoken with Frit and the other people in England. At the beginning, people say, oh, there is a controversy. You have to understand in one way or the other. No, we, there is a kind of progressive thing. There is Goldman, Alvin Goldman is a philosopher who wrote a beautiful book about different way in which you can understand people mentalizing, which you can do mentalizing, which start from mirror neuron, fine issue, finish with a complex inferential thing. Anyway, that's the point. That's with uh, my friend Corrado Sinigaglia, we call it understanding other from inside. Now, I use it fMRI in the monkey and in the humans. And of course, I was very happy of that. I may say also that when I read this paper, which has been done by a Danish group, Roland is the, I was really elated because you can see what happens in the brain without actually, when the monkey is not doing, or the human beings not doing anything. It seems to be a miracle almost. And I think for many years, for about 10 years, this miracle worked very well. It worked well when? It worked well because at the beginning the people was very careful and was thinking also about real physiology or real neuropsychology. Then I think the things go a bit astray and the people now attribute to certain areas, certain function and so on. But it's not my point to criticize. What I want to say that was something wrong, not wrong, but limitation inherent to the system and it's time. When you see one of those pictures that you saw before, time is not there. You see something, it's the end of the process. You don't know what is first, what is the second, what happened. You know what, that's the areas which become active when you do a certain action or present stimuli of different kind. Well, recently, about three, four years ago, we have been contacted by neurosurgeon in Milano which do what is called intracortical recording in humans. That's technique uh, which has been developed essentially in France and Italy, started in France in Paris, but now it's very active, the group in Milan at Niguarda. It's technique which is used for surgery in people with epilepsy, in epilepsy which do not respond to drugs. Unfortunately, about 20, 25% of people who, who is epileptic cannot be cured just by giving classical drugs. Giorgio Rorusso is the surgeon, Ivana Sartori is the neurologist who did most of the work. Uh, Pietro Manzini was the engineer who, together with other people, made all the software possible because the difficulty, they have plenty of data, I will show why, but how to put them together, how to match them, it's really a nightmare. Now, the technique. And the technique is the following. The electrode they use is this one. Maybe you can see here, 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 here are the space, the leads from which you can record. Up to now, we recorded not single neurons in the case, but gamma, very high frequency gamma, which correspond to action potential. It's not the same precision but it's, it indicates there is a lot of activity going on in terms of action potential. It's much more difficult to interpret alpha or theta or the other, but in this case it's easy. So they put this electrode and they typically put 16 electrodes. For example, in this case, the doubt was the, the lesion is the temporal or parietal part. So they put all these electrodes like that and each of them, 
So 16 electrodes. In each of them, there are 10 points of recording. It means that we have in one patient 160 points. Of course, some of them are not relevant for us. Some are in the white matter. But anyway, they are here. In order to be sure to not to do damage, they do before the angiography, which here is in blue, but this angiography, and the electrode is in between these. So technically, it's a rather complicated experiment. Now, mm, what happens is they do first this insertion of electrode, then the patient recovers, and one day know where is exactly the focus, the epileptic focus, they do the surgery. So, but during this week, in which they record EEG day and night, and they record video, because they want to know what kind of uh, uh, seizure the patient has, the patient is available. And practically everybody said, if you want to work with me, it's okay, we can do the experiment, ask me what you want, and so on. So we have a patient which is bored, it's there waiting, and it's ready to collaborate with us. So before showing you an experiment, I will show something which they do routinely, but we elaborated. They routinely stimulate the nerve, and here is the stimulation of median nerve. So here, it's simply a reconstruction of, I don't know, for 90 patients, I think. It's reconstruction of 90 patients, but time is not here. That's what we, you can see if you have fMRI, almost the same, because fMRI has other limitations. But anyway, imagine that you have MRI that you see, that when you stimulate the median nerve, you have an activation of somatosensory cortex, very strong, and then you have other activation. Now I will show you in time what happens. If you look in time, after 20 milliseconds, we have essentially the activation of primary sensory cord of S1. But after 40 milliseconds, the hotspot, it moved to motor cortex. After 60, here practically everything disappeared. It's the motor cortex which is active. And after 100, you have an activation in the region around the perisylvian gyrus and also in the insula. So what you see in fMRI, actually, it's a misleading picture because it goes in time. And if you look at the type of responses, this one is very, it's small, but very prolonged. Now I will show you the same thing in animation. You see now, we time practically disappear what happened there, and we see the perisylvian region and the insula active. So in other words, that's a very simple experiment. But even when you stimulate a median nerve, so it's, it's a stupid thing. You see how complicated is the pattern in the brain. It's not that just somatosensory cortex is active. It's active also the insula, it's active the perisylvian region, and so on. Well, then we did some experiment, which we started, so we published only two or three papers up to now, but some are in press or in elaboration. So here it's hand action, and you have the black dots, which indicate one, the hand, maybe I can show you first this. So the, uh, there are, the activity in the brain is synchronized either to the appearance of a tool of the hand, here could be a hand instead of tool, then when the action start, and then at the end of the action. So there are three synchronization, presentation of the stimulus, movement, and so here is when the hand is presented. You see at the beginning are these black dots. Then once the movement starts, you see the activation not only of the ventral scene, but also of MMT, and then it goes up in the intraparietal sulcus, arrive to the premotor cortex. And if you put on the contact, and then that we did not expect, you have an activation in S2, and you have an activation in the premotor cortex. So you see really a film. When you see an action, it's not something static, but you see the progressive. And here is the similar thing with a tool. With the tool, 
there is a lot of dots here. Remember that that's only the dots which are active. We have more than, I don't know how, 100, uh, maybe 1,000 dots, because some are not active because they're in the other part. But look at this region. That's exactly the same region which also in fMRI we see active, PFT, and then you have the same thing. If you present the same in terms of <coughs> spots, you see all this stuff. But what I want to show is another thing. Here, it's now what we are doing now, almost finished. It's time. If you look at the time, you see first the activation of desire, including MT, then this one, but not the region of tool which became active much later. So when I see somebody grasping, I see first the action. I understand he's grasping. And only later, I understand that this model is related to, um, to the tool. Here are Average the over 90, 90 subjects, you said, 90. 90 is zero subject, yeah. Okay. It's and very then, long work. Variability across your well, the variability is destroyed by the fact that we have many subjects. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, it should be variability. That's one of the problems, how to match. So we use this, I am sorry, I have not explained it, something, nobody interrupted me. But here are these flat maps that we use because of the problem just been raised. First, because the gray matter it's mostly inside the solsi. So if you see the Broadman area, you don't see most of the gray matter. If you open, you see the gray matter. And then it's much easier to match in this way using this, uh, the different uh, maps. And then here you, you look at, let's say, the high gamma contribution to the power spectrum. Only the gamma contribution, okay. exactly. Only one gamma contribution is higher than rest. Okay, but that's the Synchronizing either with the beginning or with the action or with the end. So the whole range of gamma from, let's say, 50, 50, 150. OK, 50, 150, OK. Yeah. And is there anything within that range that stands out, or is it really a broad, do you broadly cover that range? Uh, I have not. It's 50 to 150 hertz. Yeah, that should be. Did so we make a power, then, of this. But you broadly cover that range across all your subjects? The whole brain is covered. We, we examine the whole brain, but in some part, there is nothing. For example, in prefrontal cortex, if you do that, you don't see unless. Well, I was wondering whether it was, for instance, maybe closer to the to, to V V1 M MT, you might be in low ah. gamma. But if you move to motor, you might move to high gamma. So I was wondering whether it was anything like that. That we have not examined it, actually. No, that has not been examined. Right. No, mm, some part. Uh, following his question, some part are poorly explored. For example, this part here. V1 is not explored because the surgeon does not put the electrode in the primary visual cortex. Some other parts are difficult for the morphology of the brain. So not all the parts. I have a picture in which shows which parts are more explored and which are less explored. Now let me move in the last half an hour something else. What you see here is the insula. Insula is probably most of you know. It's a complex structure, but has been considered related to emotions. There is also a, a literature which is a bit uh, crazy because attribute to insula some highest function that you can imagine, consciousness and so on. But let's forget, uh, let, let's be neuroscientists. So if, <laughs> if we stimulate, the insula. That has been done by two my, two, my PhD student, uh, Fausto Caruana and uh, Gezzini from Lebanon. They stimulate the insula and found there are different regions. What I am interested at the moment is to speak about this most anterior part. Here is a red region, a blue region, and this green. What is here we have not understood because it was strange movement of the monkey. It was very inconsistent. But it was clear what happens in the red region and in the blue region. Now I will show you what happens when we stimulate this region in the monkey. 
And now there is no action potential. What you have to look is just to the monkey and what the monkey does. The red light, when appear, the monkey is stimulated. The part of the insula I show it is stimulated. Red light. Red light. You see, every time this point is stimulated, this region is stimulated, you have ingestive action. It moves the mouth, it moves the lips, and so on. Now I move just slightly ventrally in the region which is blue, here. Obviously, she's not happy. Mm. Food, she looks at it. Ah, <laughs> not good. Again, that's, that's very precious food for the monkey. Out. <laughs> she's looking strange, it seems so good. Here we don't stimulate, so to reinforce her for a moment. <coughs> Red light. Well, it's disgust. Something happened and the monkey became disgusted. There is a study of uh, Rawls, for example, and other people who show that in this region there are part of it which respond to taste, uh, other to structure of the food and so on. So there is a dorsal part which is related to ingestion, positive, and the other to negative ingestion. I don't like it. It's disgusting. I must say that a meta-analysis, again, done by the people in Ulrich, showed that the ventral part of the insula is related to the emotion, while the dorsal is more related to other activity like ingestion and so on. Okay, that was monkey. Now we did with uh, Vittorio Gallese and uh, Christian Kaiser an experiment in humans, which preceded, by the way, this one, but it doesn't matter. That was done in France, in Marseille, using uh, odorants. Because for a physiologist, use, using odorants is very complicated unless you are not trained to do it. So we applied to normal student some odorant in the nose, which could be pleasant, unpleasant, or disgusted. Let's forget about pleasant, uh, concentrate on disgusted. That was the first part of the experiment. Second part of the experiment, they observed a video in which people showed disgust or showed pleasure or neutral. Again, concentrate on the movie in which this actor showed disgust. Here it's very clear, this typical Darwin described disgust, you must do something like that. Okay, now the result. These are the result when you uh, administer natural stimuli, odorants in the nose, and the rotten eggs was the best stimulus possible. And you see this nice activation here. We were not the first to do that. It has been done before by people at university college, so it's done before. So this is activation. But what was really interesting is this one. Here, you see what happens when you what happens in the brain when you observe a face disgusted and you have a real disgust. You see this white thing. White thing are voxel which are activated in both cases. So they are activated when you see a person or you feel a person. In other words, that's the best demonstration that this system practically interpret yourself as ourself. You and me are the same thing, because this is the point which one activated, 
I am disgusted. But if I see disgusted, it's not that I make a logical conclusion. I see your face, therefore, but this is exactly the same thing. And remember that if I stimulate it, I have disgust. Also humans, there are few experiments, but in France, uh, the group of Maguire stimulated again epileptic uh, patient, their rostral insula, and they have disgust. So it's me which are disgusted, and when I see some other person is disgusted. So really I understand you from the inside, not doing any inferential logical. Uh, this has a really very important consequences because this indicates that the same truth for another structure which I have no time to speak today, which is the amygdala. For amygdala, if you stimulate amygdala, you have fear, and if you see fearful stimuli, you have the same activation. So it's a mechanism which is known here. I presented this one because we studied. The other has been done by other. But it's interesting that if you have this mechanism, it's not true that this mechanism remain in alternate all the life. For example, if you are a surgeon, if you operate, this mechanism is blocked because you can do the surgery. You don't become compassionate towards the person who you operate. A policeman, the special forces, they are trained to somehow to suppress this natural thing. So we have the possibility, there are also some experiments which are a bit complicated, in which you train to people to consider somebody good and another bad, and then you see what happens in the brain, and you see that one, the guy is bad, especially male, became very nasty. Female are more generous, but male became very nasty. So you have the possibility to modify this mechanism. But now think, just, just for a moment, then I will come back to science. Think for, for a moment on the social consequences. If you have a, an ideology, like the best example is Nazi. What happened in Germany in the 30s? If you think about Germany in the 30s, it's one of the most cultured, advanced country in the world. It's the Goethe, Beethoven, you, you can mention them, and many scientists. How it's possible that in few years they were able to persecute a group of people, especially Jews, for no reason, except because they're Jews. If you think sociologically, there's a reason. The Germans lost the war, and somebody has to be a culprit. Somebody is responsible. So the propaganda of Goebbels say, we lost the war because the, the Jewish were there, they were traitors, and so on. In addition, there were this, um, the economical situation was poor, so the people was happy. And, uh, um, if you read uh, the Eichmann process by Arendt, the philosopher, it's incredible how Eichmann was not a bad man. He simply said, I obey the order, and I was just organizing the thing. I have friends. But if you lose the capacity to think that he is exactly as you, but he is some undermension, that's the term which was used. You are not real men, you are undermension. Why you cannot organize the camps? Why you cannot organize for the good of your country? The transportation, like Eichmann essentially was doing transportation of Jews from one part to the other, and so on. So it's very dangerous if you lose your capacity to feel the other as yourself using your biological mechanism and consider that the other people are not human beings, but something similar. But at this point, what, what's wrong to put uh, some trees and to burn the trees if, if you need uh, warm? So it, it's extremely dangerous thing because I think our biological mechanisms are not unflexible, but can be modified by ideology. So ideological battles should be very important without exaggeration. But anyway, one has to think that th there is a something they are important. I will finish with my mirror mechanism, and now we go back to the cingulate -like cortex. Cingulate -like cortex, uh, oh my goodness, it disappeared my 
It's a lie. It's just, it's just a second. to find I will find in a second excuse me Okay, here is the cingulate cortex, and it has been, uh, cingulate is one of the places where very often there is epileptic uh, focus. So it has been explored many times. Now you see these points in which they stimulated, the surgeon stimulate this point to see what happens. And the black points indicate that there are movements, essentially this part is movement, these are visual sensation. But the interesting in this part here, this colored part produces laughing. Now imagine, this is a patient, which should be operated in a few days, with, with, of course, with already the electrodes in the brain. So you stimulate this part and it starts laughing. Now we show you a movie in which is a girl. The girl is invited to read, and she read uh, some word in Italian, and then a certain point... And it's compulsive. She can, if you ask why, there are two type of patient. Some try to rationalize and say, oh, something happened that's funny in my mind. The other say, I don't know. I, I start laughing, I don't know why. So this region is one stimulated produce laughing. So at this point, we presented movies in which a guy was either crying or laughing and neutral. And if you see gamma, it's extremely strong when it's laughing. When you see laughing, you have an increase of gamma activity. So the same center, which one is stimulates, produce laughing, when you see laughing, is excited. So it's again the idea that you understand laughing because your center for laughing becomes excited. To finish, so what I think the general idea that we are following now is that we have to go somehow away from classical empiricism of physiology, of English empiricism, the idea that everything is coming from out. I think the important things are inside us. And then experience on, modified, and so on. But we recognize the people, we recognize emotion. So the, 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 the newborn recognized the expression of the mother. It's nothing learned. She already has a mechanism for recognizing the expression. The work of Stern, for example, is beautiful in this sense. So this laughing is not learned, it is, it's there. And so you, by the way, I think that's a trick which many comedians use. Uh, they start laughing before telling you the story. And in some American <laughs> soap opera, you have this laughing in the background, which for me is extremely disturbing, <laughs> but it, it seems useful. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Do we have a microphone for any questions? All right, we can, we can go on nevertheless. Are there questions, Dr. Mm -hmm. All right, Lisette, let's start here in the, in the front. Yeah. Who is first, Aaron? Yeah. 
I will speak louder. So yeah, but we are close now. Okay, so that was amazing. Um, so most of the data that you have presented are average data from, uh, but I wonder about individual differences and whether you can relate individual variability with different uh, capability of empathy or to reproduce what the other is doing. Yeah. So well, the, the most clear individual difference I know is uh, between male and female uh, as far as empathy is concerned. Uh, if you think that in London, for example, Tanya Zinger and all this group, when they study empathy, they use only girls because they are, <laughs> the results are much better than with males. So that's, I think, it's very clear. For other things, I don't know. For disgust, we don't found any difference. And disgust is very common to <laughs> all ages, <laughs> all persons. And if you examine uh, some psychiatric diseases, this eventually can uh, affect that capability. Well, here was a surprise. Uh, um, CT, Jean de CT, made an experiment using a psychopath uh, in the jail in Chicago. And he showed scenes which should be very terrible. Instead, they recognized the emotion perfectly. And if you think it's not so strange, because if you are a sadist, to recognize that somebody is suffering, it's positive. So you, you recognize, but instead of having the reaction that we have poor guys suffering, we have to help him. But remember that when I talk about empathy, it has nothing to do with religious com idea of compassion and so on that became now very popular with the Pope and so on. Empathy is just to understand what is happening. Then how you behave, it depends from many factors. Even if you like so much your grandmother, but you don't know how to do it, you put it in the hospital and she's there. For her, it will be much better to stay at home. But if she's a bit demented, it's dangerous, so you put away. So not because you are, you, you are compassion, but the empathy can, uh, so you can react in a different way. And uh, the, your question is very interesting because people think that people who are in the jail, well, they don't understand emotion. They understand very well emotion. Sure. At least this type of people, I mean. <laughs> I mean, the girls from Tanya Singer understand the emotion. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, uh, yeah, um, so often, um, a great talk, uh, by the way, um, um, mirror neurons are often seen as uh, important for understanding others, right? Um, but one could say, well, the mirror neuron itself doesn't distinguish whether others do it or yourself. They respond to a common action. So could you comment on whether you find neurons that do respond? No, that's not true because, of course, if I do an action or I observe an action, I have many other cues. The first, when I do an action, I have my prefrontal lobe or single leg which say, do it. Second, I have proprioception which say that I am doing the action. When I observe you, I have the same mechanism about the action, but of course I know that it's you doing that. Yeah, 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 so the, the question for is... For emotion, it's more tricky, maybe, but uh, for action, for cold action, it's very clear. Right. But could you comment on, on the system that does respond to action, but does distinguish um, uh, the individual himself or herself and others? So I, I already told you that I think there are many elements. When I do an action, I have the will, let's mm -hmm. say, in practice. But anyway, I have my action, which is determined by my frontal lobe, by cingulate, maybe by hypothalamus if I am angry. So, the, <laughs> well, uh, don't forget the subcortical <laughs> center. They are very important. And uh, when, when I observe you, it's not so. Even if with uh, disgust or pain, I think that is different because you have the stimulus. Uh, in the other case, you, you saw it. Yeah. So you have elements. I don't think there is a possibility to confound them in, in the normal people. I don't know about possible patients. Okay. All right, Giovanni. Yeah, so thank you for the great, here. <laughs> thank, yes. you for the, thank you for the great talk. Um, so it seems to me like there's like an, an element missing, like in a, the actual. Sorry, I, I was moving. Ah, sorry. There is like an element missing in the action understanding story that is like coding for action outcome. So I think that like 
often, you know, to understand the action or a goal of an action, we also have like to somehow predict what is gonna be like the consequence of the action. It's gonna be good or bad. You know? Also like, especially also to learn from actions of other people. So my question would be like, do you find any narrow population that responds better to action outcome of other people rather than to the action? Itself? Yes, Thank you. We, we have two experiments. One we did a couple of years ago uh, with Fogassi in which we demonstrated in parietal lobe there are some neurons which fire when you do an action for a specific purpose. So I grasp to put them out, there's a discharge. I grasp to put a container, no discharge. Most of these neurons have also mirror properties. So if I see you grasping for eating, it discharges already when you grasp the object. And instead, if you put in the container, it's not. So there is a mechanism in the parietal lobe, but probably also in frontal, but we have few data on frontal. In parietal lobe, you tell, which allow you, you have a chain. Thanks to the chain, you predict the next move. What is that? When the action, the action fails. fails, if the action fails. Well, that was one of the most disappointing experiments I did because <laughs> with uh, a lady from Torino who is professor of psychology, she prepared a beautiful film in which there were action, in which, for example, one was playing chess or making a mistake, oh. the chess was falling down. So we think, what happens? Then happened nothing. I mean, there was <laughs> mirror neurons and attention. So when you see wrong thing, the attention was dominating, plus you have some mirror neuron because you move the hand. But we have not discovered anything. It was trivial. So there's still hope for me. There's <laughs> still hope for you. OK, Neil. So both of these talks were fascinating. And, and um, I wonder if you would draw some uh, links, perhaps. So in the hippocampus, you know, we see um, cells for a place, irrespective of how you know you're in the place. And in humans, you see these uh, Jennifer Aniston cells, irrespective of how Jennifer Aniston concept is, is pr produced for you. So the idea of sort of concept cells seems very um, related to both talks in the sense that it's the concept of putting something in your mouth, uh, which these, these neurons are representing. It doesn't matter who is doing which mouth, how the, how the action happens. Mm -hmm. Do you see a link there? I am a bit embarrassed no, don't look to at him. talk about. No, Jacqueline, don't look at him. I don't look at him. <laughs> no, no, I, no, actually, I don't know. If, even if uh, Moser was outside the room, I don't know. <laughs> Do you see a link? But you know maybe something. You have something in mind, I'm sure. Well, it, it, seems, um, it seems related that uh, all of your experiments, you know, going from the idea that the neurons should be just coding for the action of, of the um, owner of the effector to firing for the same action or indeed the same goal, irrespective of the yeah, type of action yeah. or who is making it, sounds very similar to the neurons which respond to the concept, not of an action in this case, but of a famous person or um, being in a place or, or being pointed in a particular direction. Uh, these are all, they're all interesting cells because they're uh, in the middle of the brain and they're not, uh, they're not dependent on the specific nature of the stimuli that's driving them. No, I see the point, yeah. But, but I don't know how to, how to approach it experimentally. You don't want to make any link. <laughs> you could say that all these cells are, uh, you know, mirror cells. Equally, you could say all these cells are constant. Well, I know that in Trondheim, that there is an attempt to find mirror neurons in the hippocampus. And uh, maybe the success is, uh, is moving. <laughs> Microphone. I mean, Nahum Ulanovsky has reported cells that uh, uh, respond to another another animal's location, uh, which are partly overlapping with the traditional place cells. I don't think that's published yet, but uh, I mean, several groups in different places in the world have seen this, so I guess it is somewhat similar. That's very similar, yeah. That's answer your question? Half. <laughs> <laughs> Come on. The, the other half is, is uh, you know, whether it's you making the action or somebody else making the action, it's just another way to get at the concept of the action. And so you can see it as like reading Jennifer Aniston or seeing a picture of her or, 
Yeah, yeah. Anyway, you're, you're bringing a concept to mind and some neurons are firing. These neurons are representing this concept. Does that, is that a common way of thinking about all of these cells? Well, they're all conceptual. I don't know, you know, the danger is to move towards something which is really conceptual. So I want to keep very close to motor system to eliminate the idea that everything is conceptual, everything is inferential and so on. So I am a bit worried to accept your point. Although I remember many years ago, Pilishir, who was a cognitive psychologist, one of the most famous, said, me, but what you discovered is just conceptual neuron. It's grasping, it's a concept, it's not motor. Well, but it's motor. But it's not motor, also. You see, that, that's the point, that's the point. All right, Tony. Uh, can you say something about the development of the mirror system? And uh, I mean, th is there any link that you can see to, say, the development of theory of mind? And also, uh, in, in children and adults who have autism, is there a, uh, anything that you can see in the mirror system that might reflect that? So your point, if there are children with some problem with this system? Well, I mean, if, if there is some link between the development yeah. of the mirror system. You know, again, I am very cautious here because I think that there is a link. I think what happens in autism, it's for genetic reasons, the motor system tends to develop late and not in a good way. If you have sufficient stimuli to overcome this difficulty, you may be concurrent. But if you don't give, you, you become autistic. But the mirror neurons are a secondary consequence. It's not like the idea of somebody who wrote broken mirror neurons there for autism. I don't think it's, it starts with broken mirror neurons. It starts with some more general deficit in the motor system. And if you, if you talk, especially with the people who rehabilitate children with autism, they will tell you that all of them have problem with subtle things, other stop moving for a certain point. So there are a lot, which typically doctors and psychologists consider it minor because you have this big problem of uh, social uh, interaction. But now there is a f strong move towards this idea because if you can do the diagnosis early, your probability to improve the condition of children increase. There is Sally Rogers in the States, in Davis, which uh, show in the, some films that if you do the diagnosis very early, then you, you manage staying a lot with kids, playing a lot with kids to, to improve very much. But if you do just uh, nothing, or the mother tried to ignore saying, oh, well, also my grandmother was a bit retarded. So it's a disaster. <laughs> You know, it's unfortunately, often, although the parents of these children, are, they like their kids, but they try to minimize, saying, oh, yes, also my cousin was a bit retarded, also my grandmother, and so on. So they tend to minimize. It's, it's a defense. Um, I don't know if you have enough data to, to say anything about this, but I wonder, to what extent, what is the overlap between the the subset of neurons that are active during observation and those that are active during the, uh, when the animal performs the action uh, or an action itself. So is the it action a, itself and the observation. Yeah, is, there, is it a random subset or is it a discrete cell so that you can actually always tell if the animal is watching another animal doing something or doing the same itself? Uh, is it possible to say anything about that, whether it's discrete subsets of cells? No. We know that most of mirror neurons are in layer 3 and therefore they should be pyramidal, pyramidal of layer 3. In layer 5, most of them are motor neurons. But exactly, and sometimes you make a mistake because, uh, for example, we describe that most of them are on the convexity. And now with the new electrode in which you can record many, many neurons, we found several of them also in the bank. So sometimes, uh, you know, some data which statistically are significant are wrong. Uh, I have actually one remark and one question. First, uh, I want to thank you very much for the lecture and for the work. 
and uh, because this is an excellent demonstration how much research in non-human primates can provide the unique discoveries in neuroscience. I want to stress out that because today we are sometimes facing uh, society or organizations that are not uh, understanding why we perform uh, research in uh, animals and especially in non-human primates and we are in front of talented and motivated uh, uh, people and students. So uh, this is really an extraordinary uh, demonstration of how much monkey research could lead to a unique discovery in the history of neuroscience. Yes, th thank you very much for that because really I don't know how in other countries but in Italy it's very difficult now to work on monkeys. Fortunately, we are somehow a well-established lab where we are not attacked. But for a new group to establish monkey experiment, it's a nightmare. I, I will tell you a story. When I was very young, my professor asked for the monkey lab, just calling the veterinary chief of our city, saying, can I do experiment of monkey? He said, yes. And who will be responsible? You, because you are the doctor. I know about cows, about uh, other animals, pigs. Now, in order to get that, you need at least one year of work, of paperwork, and it's not sure that you will receive. You have to demonstrate it's necessary, that it's no pain for the animal. It's, it's terrible. We are still living in a kind of happy island because we have monkeys since 30 years, and uh, nobody attacked us up to now. <laughs> I hope not after this talk. Okay, then, then the question, the question, the question. was, uh, uh, how can you see the uh, mirror brain and mirror neurons perspective in terms of predictive coding uh, theory? Because uh, we, we had, uh, actually, we, we, we had experiments that we published two years ago in uh, macaque monkeys using fMRI and uh, uh, playing auditory uh, sequences with the uh, high and high complexity uh, uh, of uh, organization of these sequences and deviancies, and we really, each time we activate F5 very nicely with the high order uh, sequence uh, violations, and uh, we try to interpret that in terms of predictive coding. Uh, what is your opinion about that? Well, prediction can be used in two ways. One, what I told you before, somebody asked me about if there is a way in which you could predict because the monkey is grasping one thing to the other. The other way, more scientific, more, if you want, mathematically oriented, is the idea of Friston. Friston and the, the group in London, including uh, Kilner, who is really an expert of mirror neurons, they claim that they are not so important for understanding things, but they make a hypotheses a priori. So you have some hypothesis that you are going to bring something, and when you see it, there is matching between this a priori thing. So our idea that you must activate this neuron, he thinks that the neurons are already activated, and then they meet together somewhere, maybe in STS, the, the stimulus coming. It's a very interesting idea, but people working in, mod in modeling claims that they should lose a lot of time. This, this, this system is very clever in principle, but they are not sure that it will work in real life because it takes time. But it's, it's very, very, I'm very fond of this group because they work very well. Hello, and thank you for such a fantastic talk. Um, I hate to bring up the conceptual again, but... Um, That's becoming because <laughs> it's easier when I can hear well. Yeah. Okay. Um, but I was wondering if you could give some type of thought on um, if you think the functionality of mirror neurons could be attributed to more indirect forms of empathy such as the triadic relationship between an artist, the artwork, and the viewer? I have not understood. <laughs> well, I can hear very well. Yeah. So you're asking for like a reinterpretation of the mirror neuron idea yeah. towards another context. Right, exactly. Right? And which is more, it's more of an indirect kind of form of... When I interact with one person with another, well, triadic, so she wants the artist... Ah, triadic she yeah. wants. With, yeah. a, let's say, a piece of art, like the artist interacting with a piece of art and an audience. And the viewer, yeah. And the viewer. 
But there are many examples we can invent now, right? So this will, this will scale badly. Uh, but you are thinking about figurative art or the performance? Because figurative art, there are some people think that in a sense what the artist put in the painting, then it's recovered by the person looking at it. So even some people think like Friedberg, that even the movement are important. If you think of some art, uh, so you can recognize the movement of Pollock or of Fontana. So the idea that you appreciate because you feel inside yourself the movement which has been done. But that's, I think, <laughs> I don't know, that's really speculation, even worse than my political speculation. <laughs> Come on. But you got provoked, it's okay. I have provoked. <laughs> yeah. No, I think oh, everybody agrees. Yeah, right. I think nobody is it's a fan of Goebbels. <laughs> Hello. Thanks for the talk. Uh, just a question. Uh, do, do we know uh, if this newer system is uh, more innate or more acquired over time in patients? And if it is acquired, you know, that's... Do we have any idea of what could be the teaching signal, the invariant in both the observed and the executive action? You know, the people like to fight very much. So we have people who think that mirror neurons are innate, and there are people who think they are completely <coughs> learned. Uh, I think both of them are right. So some of them should be innate, but certainly some you, you learn. For example, innate, evidence for innate, it's the merits of experiment, and the merits of showing this tongue protrusion and has been replicated even in the monkey, so I think it's true, or those some people. And if you read uh, the development books, uh, it's a lot of communication between mother and kids, which is immediately, almost immediately at the birth. On the other hand, there is no doubt that one, as soon as you learn the new skill, then you understand better. There is an experiment done in, uh, in Amsterdam uh, in which they presented to a child which is still unable to walk uh, a film of child moving, and there was no desynchronization of the rhythm. Instead, if you uh, show to the same kids a guy, a small boy, crawling, and he is able to crawl, there is a desynchronization. As soon as the boys start to walk, walking is very good. And then there is a famous experiment made in London by Calvo Merino, Haggard, and the other about the dancer. So the dancer, if you see, if, if I am a dancer, I see some body dancing, there is some activation by mirror neurons, but it's not so big. If I am a professional dancer, it's a huge activation. But only if I am a dancer of ballet, which you observe, because there are professional dancers of classic ballet and those of capoeira. Those of capoeira, if you can dance classical dance, you have the same reaction as myself. Mm -hmm. So no reaction. But if they see the other. So that's clear that learning uh, uh, some skill you, you know how so to do all it. All this learning could happen. What is the training signal? What is the invariant, for example? Is it, for example, an higher order invariant? Or, for example, for the, the infant acquiring, uh, I mean, having the same response, for example, for observing someone watching? Now we are talking about, uh, for example, grasping. Mm. Because different type of grasping, the invariance is very big because they are completely different. Yeah. yeah. That's why I stress the, the goal of the action, rather the kinematics or the dynamics of movement. Okay, thanks. So, so Jacko, one thing, that, um, one thing that worries me a little bit, or worries me is I find it an interesting challenge. You say, look, we, over, we overcame this traditional empiricist view on the brain, right? Because now you also show there's internal structuring, if you want. Yeah. So how action is generated and the actions of others are interpreted. Okay, great. But on the other hand, if you look at your, if we look at your data, I could all say, well, but maybe, but but another, you are re possibly facing a challenge of this traditional faculty psychology view, where distinct functions are really localized, right? Because you look at the insula, there, there, there we see more or less say a valence kind of dimension, very locally expressed. Cingulate would be let's say your laughing center, and then we have let's say a, a premotor, uh, parietal kind of system 
for more action related, right? So it becomes very localized. So now, how should I think about, let's say, the mirror brain to, to transcend this idea of very local functions? No, I don't see there is a contradiction because when I say the mirror brain is because I have this center, which are, have an internal model of laughing, let's say. When I see you laughing, this center uh, became active. Mm -hmm. So about laughing, there is different type of laughing. Uh, maybe there is a center of laugh. You know, sometimes laughing is because you feel superior. So this laughing is completely different when you are laughed because there is a joke. So maybe there is different center for laughing, but certainly one is there because when you stimulate, you laugh, and when you show a laughing person. But, but so I am not convinced there is only one center for laughing or one center. But I think there is centers, and not that everything is learned empirically, that we are tabula rasa. Then. Yeah, but what, what, isn't that annoying to you? Because now we have qualitatively different models that in order for me to deal with you now, I must again link all these, I have to bind all these models together, right? So is there then a meta model that does that, or is, it, is, the, is there only a linking between these sub-models? No, one point which should be clear, that unfortunately people still make a confusion, are con convinced that the mirror system is motor system in premotor cortex. And so if you have laughing, so it should go through the motor cortex to back to cingulate and so on. I think they are completely separate center. So the transformation of sensory information, motor information, it's made in parallel in many completely different center. Mm -hmm. But how do I bind them now together in, if I want to respond to you? I say, oh, Jacqueline was laughing because I told him my latest dirty joke. Yeah. Right. So, so how how do I then bind these these models together and the predictions that they make? And that might also be contradictory. So, how do you bring it then together? So, you're saying you have like a divergence or different models that run in parallel that allow they, you to interpret what you do. I right? think they are working in parallel. So, I <laughs> think when I uh, when I mentioned somebody asked me about attention, that's all completely in parallel. So, we see that when you move your hand and you play chess in normal way, you have the mirror activity. If you do that and then you move strangely, so you have mirror neuron you know, at the beginning and then attentional system, which okay. say, oh, mm -hmm. something wrong. But who does the arbitration now between these subsystems? <laughs> That's my now he's pushing me towards philosophical issue. <laughs> no, an open <laughs> which question. I don't know doing. No, no, but, but the arbitration. an open question. So the arbitration to decide. Mm -hmm. Yeah, am I, is it going to be attention or, or a mirror system response, right? The, where are you going to look? If you have, uh, to, if you have to address this... Well, if I have a model how to play chess and somebody is doing something crazy, yeah. uh, my brain immediately understands it because it's against the model. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, so about sport, you... there are many examples. For example, professional uh, basket player mm -hmm can know if the ball will go in the basket. Instead, even a good player often doesn't know. Sure. That has been studied yeah. and it's rather sure. common. Mm -hmm. OK. So we have another question in the back? After this philosophical question, it's finished. Nice, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> please, give me something concrete. <laughs> yes, so please. A much more practical question. Um, I mean, we can also imagine carrying out movements. And, uh, and I was wondering uh, if, if you consider these as sort of different certainly phenomenologically different, of uh, carrying out an actual grasping movement, watching someone else carrying out a grasping movement, and then imagining carrying out a grasping movement. Uh, have you or would you imagine seeing different signatures, maybe in the where the activity is, the kind of activity? Uh, that no, that, that has been done. By the way, that's a very good example why I think that uh, when we say understanding from the inside, from inside. Because if you have motor imagery, using the general term, motor imagery, you imagine to play tennis, or if you play tennis, or if you observe somebody playing tennis, practically the same structure which are activated, except the motor cortex, because for playing you have to use it. But that's something which is well known by sport trainer, especially in uh, athletics in which they say, repeat mentally how you will jump. And that's the same like jumping. So, but anyway, coming back to science, it's exactly the same structure. It's activated when I think an action, when I do an action, I observe an action, except the motor cortex, because you don't perform the action. 
No, but that, that's a very important point. For me, it's very convincing that really the mirror system is somehow me, because when I think of the action, it's the same structure which is activated. So it's, but that's, that's something we discussed with Jean Leroux many years ago. All right, so thank you very much, Giacomo, um, also for your <laughs> stepping up. So then I again want to thank uh, Edward and Giacomo and, and all of you for being here, for having a great session this morning where we learned a lot. Anna, you have some announcements?